I love it when people ask me about River Life because I love to tell the story. I love to talk about what God's doing here in this community. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoy talking about is every once in a while I'll get someone ask me, why, River Li- why the name River Life? And, so I, and I love to tell the story because it's a powerful story. It comes right out of the Bible. And if you were here a year ago, you heard me tell this, and then periodically I mention it a little bit. But I thought it'd be great being one year in to revisit the passage that gave birth to the name River Life. Although the idea was something that God had given Pofo and I long before I ever ran across the passage. Uh, because for a lot of years, Pofo and I had been, been in ministry. Um, a, a number of you have been in churches with us and been in small groups with us and workshops. And, and over the years, what we saw was we saw person after person really spiritually struggling and spiritually dry. Almost, I, I almost have th- this, this image of like a, a starving, emaciated person kind of trying their best to go to church every week and trying their best to kind of be good, um, but they were starving. And, and so as Pafo and I started to envision what a church would look like, um, I started reading the Bible. That's what pastors do. They research and read the Bible. And so I started reading ar- along. And, and I knew the place that I wanted to go, which was the prophet books. Because you see, the prophet books in the Old Testament, the prophet books actually have some of the harshest condemnation of, of the Israelites in anywhere in the whole Bible. But... They also have some of the most amazing metaphors and images of hope and restoration that you can find anywhere in the Bible. And I think that's really important. So as a little side note, I want to tell you this, that if you have ever felt condemned by someone in the church without given hope, they did it wrong. Okay, because that's not how God works. Don't get me wrong. God offers judgment and offers uh, condemnation at times, but there is always hope. And if, if you have ever experienced that, if you have ever experienced the condemnation without the hope from the church, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that was your experience. But here, we, we want to understand that there are both sides to this. There's the reality that sometimes we disobey God. Sometimes we walk away. Sometimes we try and take life on our own. And as a result, God can sometimes let us, <laughs> let us live life on it, our own. And often that doesn't end too well. <laughs> And and that's kind of what happened with the Israelites. So in these prophet books, as I was reading through, some of these amazing metaphors of hope and restoration, I had to also face this reality of where the Israelites were at that time period. So this was around 500 B.C., around 600, 500 B.C., around that time period. Give yourself a little time reference there. And the Israelites had kind of blown it. And they they had sort of been blowing it for a few years now. And and God had been redirecting them and save them and then they blow it again. Save them and then they blow it again. Okay? And and they kept turning away from God. They kept trying to get their life together without God. And without the way God instructed them to get their life together. Because they were wanting to do it in other ways. They were wanting to do it in the ways that, that their neighbors were doing it. And the world was saying they should do it. And and as a result, they got farther and farther and farther away from God. And then God was like, okay, you want to walk far away from me? I'll let you go far away from me. So in in a relatively short period of time, the nation of Israel, which was one of the major superpowers at one time, became kind of decimated in a matter of a fairly short period of time. Their city, Jerusalem, was destroyed. The temple, which was the crowning jewel of Jerusalem, it was the place where God resided. God withdrew his presence, and that temple was destroyed. And then there were some groups of people who, who God allowed to enter in and take the Israelites captive. Their temple was destroyed, their land was overrun, 
and they were taken as slavery to a foreign land. Everything that was valuable to them, everything that God had promised to them and made a covenant to them for, God had taken away. It was undoubtedly the darkest time for the Israelites. So if you imagine being spiritually dry, if you imagine losing hope, Try living in that state for 70 years. And that was the state of the Israelites. Pretty dark. Pretty hopeless. Pretty broken. Living in a foreign land. Having all that they valued destroyed. And that was where the book of Ezekiel comes in. Now, Ezekiel was one of the prophets. God chose and selected some prophets to write some of these books. And and some of them involved some really harsh condemnation of the Israelites for their rebellion and their wanting to do life on their own, and then of the surrounding nations. But the reason that I love the prophet books is God doesn't stop there. And nor do I believe that churches should ever stop there. I don't believe churches should ever stop with simply telling what you're doing is wrong. That that we as a body should never stop simply to point out your sin. Because that's not where God stops. The story continued. And, And in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel experienced some visions. And we don't know exactly what these were, whether he was sleeping, whether he was just lean, dozing under a tree, whether these somehow actually happened and he, he transported. We don't really know, but they were visions where an angel visited Ezekiel, this prophet, and gave him some amazing visions about what hope could look like. These visions were what, what restoration could look like. And, and these visions were what it would look like when you turn back to God. And it was Ezekiel's challenge. It was his call to take those visions and tell the Israelites, don't give up. Because when we turn back to God, an amazing thing can happen. And this is just one of the metaphors, one of many that are in the book of Ezekiel. Um, and, and there's one particular metaphor about a river. And this river brought life. And that's actually where we got our name, River Life. It was out of Ezekiel 47. And, and I, that, so I actually, before I read a, the passage, I actually have a diagram here to help you sort of see what this, this vision was like. Okay? So it started over here that an angel visited Ezekiel. So this is found in Ezekiel 47, if you like to follow along. I'll, I'll, we'll read the passage together up on screen in a little bit. But I thought seeing it visually would help you guys a bit. So Ezekiel starts over here, and you can kind of see the angel here, see the little angel wings. And there was this fountain. See the little fountain at, at the edge of the picture here? That fountain came from the temple of God. Now, it didn't just kind of burst out of the ground. This, temp- this fountain actually burst out of the door of the temple. And then it started to flow. And it started to flow. And the angel walks Ezekiel out. And notice it gets deeper and deeper. And then this river gets deeper and deeper and deeper until it actually gets out to the sea, which is really a lake. It's not like the Pacific or Atlantic or anything. Okay. But what happens there, and here's the thing, is it, you heard of the Dead Sea, like the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls and all that? The Dead Sea, there's a reason it's called the Dead Sea. Nothing grows there. The salt content is so high, it actually prohibits anything but like microbacterial life. No life can live in the Dead Sea. But God doesn't work that way. Because in this vision of this river that came from the temple, which remember, that's where God resided, this river that came from God actually flowed into the Dead Sea. And here's the amazing thing. This freshwater river made the salt water fresh. Think about that for a sec. Okay? Water doesn't work like that. But God does. God takes life and brings it into what was formerly dead. And then from this river, what you see is fruit trees, 
grow and bloom where there were, there were no trees before. Okay, so there's a little visual. Now let's read the passage. Let's actually read this. Okay, I, this is, this is going to be a shorter sermon, quite simply. I have two points I'm making today, and that's about it. Okay, but I'm going to read, it's a long passage, it's 12 verses, but I want to read the whole thing because this is the root. When I talk about, when I intro the, the services here with our mission is to bring hope and healing to Second Gen Mong, this is what hope and healing looks like. This is one of the best passages that I found in the entire Bible about what hope and healing and what, what we desire for us as River Life. So let's go ahead and read through some of this, okay? Starting with verse 1. So this is Ezekiel talking, and he, he refers to this thing, the man. This is actually the angel that visited him as part of his vision, okay? The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. I know that's a lot of south and east in directions. Beginning to sound like Google Maps here for a sec, but just flow with it. Just go with it. It's okay. Here we go. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. What's a cubit? I have no idea. I don't, nobody really knows what a cubit does. No. It, it's a unit of measurement, so a thousand cubits. And then he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was like a river that I could not cross. Because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? I want to pause there. Son of man, do you see this? And as we sit here a year into river life, I want to ask all of you, do you see this? Do you see what river life has done? And what, do you see what God has done in river life this past year? Do you see the lives changed? Do you see the marriages that are healthier? Do you see the people who have some hope and have found some healing? So I think the angel grabbed Ezekiel because he wanted to make sure he saw the fullness of what was going on here. And I can just imagine Ezekiel walking, getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and he's, he's waiting to get put on his little floaties pretty soon. It just gets deeper and deeper, and then all of a sudden, okay, before it gets too deep, pause. The angel goes, pause, pause. Do you see this? So that's the first thing that I want to kind of challenge all of us, is do you see this? God is moving here in River Life. He is moving all throughout the Twin Cities here in churches and Hmong churches and Anglo churches and, and Kedu churches and Hispanic churches and all kinds of churches. God's moving. God's moving here at River Life. Do you see it? And you know what? And if you don't, if you're not sure, if you're new to River Life, just walk up to someone and say, what's River Life been like in your life? And, it, and they'll probably have a story, just like the people we got on camera here. And we're going to post these up online. So if you're new to River Life and you want to see it, you can see it on Vimeo in a, in a few more days. Okay? So that's the first thing the angel pauses. So I want to pause all of us and say, do you see it? Do you see the goodness of what God is doing through River Life and through you guys? Okay, let's continue. Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. And here it is, listen to this. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Okay, again, that doesn't happen in natural life. That does not happen by our efforts. God is in the business of bringing life into dead areas. So I don't know what area of your life is dead right now, but God is in the business of bringing life into that area through this river. Let's continue. Okay? Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. Okay? Including the place where nothing lived before, where there was no hope of fish, 
the Dead Sea, through God's river, God's presence, God's life, brought life to that Dead Sea. There will be large numbers of fish because the water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. And here it is. Listen to this. So where the river flows, everything will live. And that is actually kind of our church verse right there. For where the river flows, everything will live. We want the river of God to flow into you. And wherever it flows into you, there you will have life and have it abundantly. And then it just gets better. Listen to this. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Geliam. Okay? There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. They'll get all the, the, the striped bass and all the walleye and all the yummy stuff you can get. They'll be f- fishing it there. Here you go. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh, for they will be left for salt. You still got to have salt. I like beef jerky. We need salt. Okay. Fruit trees, and then it gets better. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. And here's one of my favorite, sort of my second favorite verse. Here it is. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Now, why is that my second favorite? My first is wherever the river flows, there will be life. Why is this one my second favorite? Because this is my vision for us as River Life. That you will be so blessed, you will be so hope-filled, you will be so healed that you can turn around and be a blessing to others. A broken, hopeless person is not a great blessing to people. They're kind of like a Debbie Downer at the party. But a hope-filled healed person can be a blessing to others. Because the truth is, I don't want us to just have hope and healing for Second Gen Mong and stay in this auditorium. That does this world no good. Christians locked up behind curtains does this world no good. But you want to do this world good? Allow yourself to come here to be healed. Find some hope in the hopeless areas of your life. Those addictions you can't shake. That, that relationship that all you can seem to do is argue and fight. But have God bring some hope into that. And then we go out into this world. We go that way, we go that way, we go that way, we go that way. And we be a blessing to the people around us. Let the fruit of river life be good for food. Let the leaves of river life be good for healing. That's you guys. You guys are the fruit of river life. You guys are the leaves of river life. You are the ones who can bring food, literal and spiritual, to the world outside these walls. You guys are the ones that have leaves that can bring healing. God has healed you so that you can heal others. So God has healed you, and that's my desire. That's my desire for river life. That's why I love this passage, that we are a community of hope-filled and healed people so that we can turn around and bless others. And you guys have done an amazing job at that already. We're, we're about to bless some kids. We've blessed some homeless people here in the cities. Uh, we've blessed some kids overseas. You guys are a blessing. And now as we move into year two, I want you guys to be a blessing to your parents, especially when they drive you nuts. I want you to be a blessing to your siblings and your cousins, especially the ones that you keep getting into fights with and you get into arguments with. We want you to be a blessing to them. Not a thorn, not a hassle, but a blessing. And that's why River Life is here. There is a river of God that offers life to anyone who comes to it. For everywhere the river flows, there will be life. And I think that's God's invitation all throughout the Bible, to come to him and receive life.
That's why Jesus came, so that we can come to God. Through Jesus Christ, we can come to God and receive that healing and have a relationship with him that the Israelites could only dream of. Literally, they dreamt of visions of what that type of relationship would be like. And Jesus was the one who came to actually make this vision possible. Ezekiel never experienced this vision in his lifetime. They came back, they rebuilt the temple, they restored worship in the temple, God's presence returned, so it was good. But it wasn't river of God good. But through Jesus Christ, we can now experience what Ezekiel only dreamed of which was a life-giving river that is open to every one of us at any point so that we can be refreshed, restored, and then turn around and be a blessing to others. So that's my desire for River Life. That's my desire for every one of you. And I hope that's your desire too. If your desire to, is to, to come here and kind of do church, Let's work on that a little bit. Let's talk about that. If your desire is to come here to be healed in some of those broken areas of your life and to find some hope in some of those hopeless areas of your life, keep coming back because you're in good company.